agenda uh, for the uh, discussion is uh, putting the organization on a digital skills roadmap journey, right? That's right. And since you are a veteran from the industry and you have spent uh, so many years, more than 20 years uh, in the industry, you would have yourself realized that uh, even the learning and development industry has transformed a lot in the last 10 odd years, especially uh, with the help of digitization or digitalizations. Gone are those days when we used to probably send the hard copy of the courseware uh, in the training room, wherein we used to collect uh, the attendance sheets, the hard copies of the feedback forms, and we used to collate all those uh, data, you know, uh, you know, just to ensure that uh, we have uh, the all the data points or the intels for the analysis, right? So That's everything right. is right now on LMS or LXP, right? So I would like to uh, initiate the discussion by asking you my first question that in today's rapidly evolving digital landscape, how do you envision the role of learning and development in driving the digital skills transformation within the organizations? So okay. So I'll take a step back from the digital transformation. What I would like to start with is my experience of 21 years in L&D. Um, I think digital transformation is here. We all need to catch up with it. There is no two ways about it. But one thing I keep uh, highlighting in every meeting that I have or every session that I do is don't be in a rat race to catch up with the digitalization. First thing that an L&D leader or an HR leader needs to understand is Try and see if this is exactly what your organization needs. If the need of the organization is digitalization, then go ahead and do that. The need, let's say I'm working in a startup, uh, which is pretty, uh, you know, they don't have the systems in place. They don't have uh, the kind of budgets in place. So do I really get on to the journey of digitalization right away? Maybe not. I might take a step back understand what kind of learning needs are required by the organization and then look at the digitalization or bringing in the digital tools into the system. But if I'm working in an organization which is an MNC or a global organization, what we typically do is we pick up what is required for us to reach the scale of employees that we have in the organization. The fastest way to do that is definitely a digital transformation journey that is required. So that is understanding the learning needs. So we as l &D professionals, we are not, um, I wouldn't personally want someone to tell me what to do, but I would like to do my own dipstick before I proceed and do what I, you know, what, what I'm supposed to do. Now, having said that, now, today, if I look at organizations, we do a lot of comparative analysis between multiple organizations or the industries that we are working in. I work for an IT services company. I work, I, I primarily come with an IT services kind of a background. Um, so for us, what is important is the scalability, the pace, the agility at which we go ahead and reach that journey is important for me. When I say agility and scale, then I don't have time to waste because when a leader reaches out to me, he says, I want a set of skills to be up, I mean, an employee to be upskilled on a set of skills by yesterday. That's always the ask from the business. And we from l and cannot push back and say, hey, you know what, Vivek, I would need maybe 20 days to upskill this employee. Maybe not. That's That might not work because the business is not going to work. The client is not going to wait, right? So that is when I really need to look at a model where the digital skills that are required by that employee are completely in line with the requirement of the customer or the client, number one. So the scale is important. The speed is important. Also look at how soon you can get those skills uh, into the employee and deploy that person immediately. So this should be the combination. Again, I wouldn't say one size fits all. For every organization, the requirement will be different. Um, if I have, see, if you ask me, I'm an old-fashioned, what do I say, conventional way of uh, teaching uh, in a classroom kind of a trainer. So if you ask me, I would like to bring the entire group into a classroom and teach them digital skills. That's the best way because the focus is 100%. The people are here. Um, they're, they're with you in the classroom. You give them some uh, case studies. You make them work. You ensure that this is done. But today, with organizations which are working globally, this, this model doesn't work. So I would pick an approach which is a blended model, which has a bit of virtual instructor-led classes so that you do have the personalized kind of learning 
plus i would also rely on uh, multiple vendors that i have in the market who can partner with us and curate those courses for our employees so that's the model i would like to deploy is to be an interesting perspective Sarisha. now uh, this brings to my next question uh, wherein you mentioned that speed and scale is important now in the last decade or so uh, one of the uh, you know main or leading example uh, which we have seen for digitization or digitalization is the banking industry wherein not only the entire system has evolved or changed the entire user experience uh, in the banking industry has changed i mean gone are the days when one has to stand in queues to get the passbook updated you see right everything happens uh, you know uh, via the app nowadays whether it is money transfer or any transaction for that matter right now just take this as an example the banking industry as a case could you please share a compelling example or a case study where your organization successfully implemented a digital skills transformation program and what were uh, its key driving factors of the success i mean sure. it could be with your current organization or uh, uh, the kind of role which you have handled in your previous organization any example which you like to share with us sure uh, so uh, most of the it services company that i worked uh, either they do have their headquarters in india or uh, these people are based, uh, you know, they still do have offices across the globe, right? So one of the customer that I worked with uh, during one of the, you know, organizations that I was associated with was a banking uh, customer. Now, banking for me had always been on-premise kind of a background because that's how I've grew, uh, grown up with. But this is definitely not an on-premise. They don't have any corporate offices. They do not have any banks they do not have any, uh, what do I say, centers or offices across the globe. So what we did is we had to come up with a plan so that we digitalize or we kind of, uh, you know, build a uh, digital literacy among the employees within that particular project. So they've given us a list of skills that they require. Uh, one, we can easily go to the market and bring those people in and say, hey, you asked for them, we can give you these people. But again, you know, getting the right fit is always a problem, right? So we have taken people from the market with the vanilla skills. We were starting this project, or I would say we started with this RFP and we got into this project, um, you know, a few years back. When we started on, but then we understood the requirement that the client had and build those skills through a blended learning version. Again, when I say blended learning version, we had built a lot of industry-specific case studies and caselets. Um, this in conjunction with the client. Again, are you an ex are we an expert there? Not likely. Sometimes we do have the expertise within the organization because we work with multiple projects in banking sector. But have we done that all the time? No. So what happens is this is a, a curated course in conjunction with the client and the customer. And we bring in caselets so that the actual learning or the skilling that is happening with the customer or uh, with, the, with the employees is in conjunction with the real life scenarios. So that is how we were able to pilot a session and uh, complete the training program for them. And uh, all of the employees who are being trained are successfully deployed and it's a long term engagement and it is ongoing today. Um, and uh, I think it's one of the most successful projects that we have. Great, fantastic. And you mentioned, uh, Shirisha, that you like to do uh, the things in the old uh, fashioned way from the old school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see that as digital skills requirements continue to evolve, how do you foster a culture of continuous learning and adaptability among employees? What advice do you have for organizations looking to instill a learning culture? Why I'm asking is it because you mentioned that while you like to do it old fashioned way, while the new lot, the new generation, because of the social media impact and all, they are probably more digital savvy. But when you look at the old generation, I mean, they are a bit, uh, you know, uh, you know, vulnerable uh, to any kind of change you see. So, uh, you know, any comments on the same? Sure. So this, this uh, takes me of continuous learning and adaptability among employees. Sure. This takes me back to a model which I always believe in. Again, uh, you can quote this as my example. Um, what I typically do when I join an organization, I've been setting up L and D functions within organizations, so I come with that expertise. Uh, when I say setting it up from ground zero, 
uh, even with organizations, we did not have L and D as a specialization. HR does their own piece, and HR walks in and you know gets a vendor from the market and does the training uh, programs. To setting it up like a proper L and D function all by itself. I follow this model called the 70-20-10 model. When I say 70-20-10, 70 are the organizational skills. Every organization is doing a business today. If I go to my management and say, you know what, we don't want to deliver what you want, the organization is going to shut shop and say that we don't need an L&D leader. So end of the day, our bread and butter is the skills that are required by our clients or customers. So every person who joins the organization comes with a set skill. We work on upskilling and cross-skilling them. And this cross-skilling and upskilling is in, definitely in line with what the customer wants. And when I say customer wants, those skills could be uh, technical, it could be behavioral, it could be uh, product related, it could be um, you know domain related, name it and we do it all, right? And compliance to top it all because those are the most important skills too. So when we do that, the organization is happy, the customer is happy, the employee is happy, I would say. Now, the 20% which I talk about are the market skills. Now, being an L&D professional, if I do not look out of my window and see what are the evolving trends that are coming in the market, I need to have this information available at every point. Because today, L&D professionals are having a seat at the table. When I say at the seat at the table, they are participating in the strategic decision making of the organization. If I do not have this set information with me, I would not be able to deliver any anything that the, that the organization wants. So I would do my research. I, in the sense, me and my team are going to do the research, come back and say, hey, you know what? These are the skills. I speak to the delivery leaders on a regular basis. So we talk to them, we tell them, I have looked at the RFPs that the organization is getting over the past six months or three months. We see there had been a request to give a set of skills from the customer side. Do you see any merit in upskilling people or employees on the skills? Now we take a consensus from the uh, delivery leadership and then we kind of tailor that into the regular requirement. The third part is the 10%, which I would go to are the aspirational skills for the employee. Now, as a person, you and me, we have aspirations, right? Someone asks you, what do you want to do five years from now? I would say, I don't know about five years, but I know what exactly I want to do in a month's time, right? And youngsters think differently. They are continuously picking up new skills on the go. Today, Microsoft Copilot is what we are talking about. If we are not upskilling our teams on that, they will move on to another organization which is helping them with those skills. So the 10% is whatever you aspire to do. Someone who is in delivery, hardcore delivery, might like a Java developer, might want to pick up a photography as a hobby. Just giving an example. Or the person might want to pick up something in digital marketing. You might say, why digital marketing? But this person says that I've been in J doing Java for the past 10 years. Tomorrow I become a managerial, I take up a managerial position. Uh, and then later I move into a leadership level. I want to have some skills in digital marketing. Then we don't stop that individual. We encourage them to pick up those skills while they're not measured on those skills. That encouragement to go ahead and do something beyond their work life is always there. So here we are addressing the organizational concern, the customer's concern, and also the employee's concern. Plus, we are also sprinkling it with the latest trends that we see in the market. So it's a package in itself. Great. I mean, it has to be a pull rather than a push, right? Absolutely. While I would like to say that, you know, every L&D leader would want a, a, a pull to happen rather than a push, uh, I would still say there is a lot of push which happens uh, because L&D, again, we do have a role to play in the organization. If you leave the employees today, they say that we don't want to do any learning. So we need to mandate learning to an extent and we need to make it more encouraging by adding a lot of gamification or uh, create those leaderboards or give them that encouragement by giving them some awards or rewards. Um, so all of that needs to be baked into the system. I agree. I mean, as an L&D professional, I must confess that it has to be a right balance between a Absolutely. pull and a push. Now, that leads to me to, to, to my next question, which is another balance. Mm -hmm. And that balance is about the personalization and scalability. So in the context of digital skills development, Sirisha, how do you balance the need for personalization and scalability in learning initiatives? And what strategies have worked best for your organization? 
So I think 20 years back when I came uh, in into the L&D function, there was something called IDPs, Individual Development Plans. I don't know if you heard about it. I worked for a large organization and I walked in and I was told, hey, you need to fill your IDP. It was a paper and pen thing and I filled my IDP and handed it over to my uh, manager. I still believe that is the best model to, uh, till today. We have uh, kind of uh, re-christened it as role-based learning journeys, or we would have, we would call that as personalized uh, learner-centric, uh, uh, you know, uh, learner-centric uh, programs, whatever you call that as, it's still the same. So basically what fits Vivek is something that is not going to fit me. So we have, let's say, 10,000 people in the organization. Now, 10,000 people, are we going to have 10,000 different learning programs? Maybe not. But most of them will be common for a person who moves into a certain level. So we call this the career progression. For every employee, when they join the organization, we give them a complete picture as to how do you move up the lateral uh, chain if you really move from one level to another and a horizontal chain. Today, you are a techie. Tomorrow, you want to be a management person. So you don't have to go up the uh, trail, but you can move to the horizontal uh, structure. So this is what we build. And for every role, there is a competency metrics which is prepared. And that is something that you need to go through and complete your learning journeys. So these learning journeys work fantastic. These are measured. Uh, again, a lot of organizations uh, are also mapping this to their uh, promotion, um, at the appraisal cycles. And we also see that every employee completes the journey before they move into the next year. Got it. Great. So, I mean, it's like courses for courses and you rightly mentioned because there's an old English proverb that one man's meat can be another man's poison as well. Think that suits you doesn't mean that it will suit me as well, right? Not at all. Yeah. Not at so, all. Absolutely. So I agree with you. And when it comes to scale, again, there is a lot of dependency on the digitalization. We need digital tools. We need uh, uh, we need uh, those kind of uh, metrics which are built on the system. Because if I have to reach out to 10,000 people, it is hard for me to follow an Excel sheet or a manual uh, database to see which employee is doing where, what. Second thing that we need to uh, gather and share as analytics is the leaderboard to the to the managers saying that your person is here today and that we need a little push from your end for them to move from um, you know a level a to level b so this is something that we need to do plus build that little competition between team members say that hey srisha is up there she's already cleared two courses she's moving quickly to the next grid now vivek is here vivek you're still in level one you might want just like the game video games that the kids play how do kids get a glue to the video games because there is some merit at every stage right it could be coins it could be points whatever you call it as we build that into the regular uh, learning plans Great, fantastic. Now, this brings to my last question uh, for today's discussion, which is that data and analytics play a crucial role in measuring the impact of digital skills development programs, Shrisha. So can right. you elaborate how your organization leverages data to assess the effectiveness of such learning initiatives so that you can make those data-driven decisions? So I would uh, start with leading by example, Vivek. It's very, very important that this is not just for the workforce. This is even for the leadership, right? The moment we say that, uh, you know, you need to learn something, why don't you as a leader say that, hey, I learned this new skill today and this is what I learned. And we conduct those little programs within the organization. We call it the leadership series. So the leadership series typically is about a new skill or a new thing that the leader had learned over a past uh, few months or past few years. They come and talk about it. This is by building that awareness within, within the employee force, I mean, workforce that we have within the organization. They really take it seriously and they say, hey, Srisha learned this, then maybe there is some merit in learning the skill. Um, this is one thing that we have done. Building that growth mindset in the individual. When you're having those mentoring discussions with the, I mean, we do have mentors within the organization. So we do have those regular conversations with people saying that uh, this is the way you need to build your career and uh, constantly monitoring what they need. If they need a special aid, let's say there is a certification policy within the organization. Today, I see that one of the team members of mine who is in L&D is contemplating whether to do a L&D certification or a PMP certification. The first thing I would do is I'll have a conversation with that employee to see what exactly they want to do. And then probably 
prepare them for that certification saying that hey you know what pmp in lnd is fantastic we can we can definitely utilize that and then encourage them to go ahead and think outside the box another important thing or an initiative that we have within the organization is building that peer learning and we do have whatsapp group so when a training program or a, or a learning session or an intervention is conducted we just don't leave it at that and we are, we do it for niche programs we don't do it for all the programs though we create a whatsapp group a lot of questions are posted on the whatsapp group asking people as to how they're implementing that learning in their day to day life is there a problem is there a fix how did that change their life so these are the questions that we ask periodically so this gets them thinking rather than forgetting what they learned the second thing what we do is we also send recommendation to the leaders based on the data analytics that we have we go to the leader we create those heat maps we tell them uh, let's say vivek we do have 10 people in your team who are in banking and they are trained or skilled on a certain technology but typically in this project that particular technology is not being used is there a chance that we can use this employee in a different project with the same team so this is called as right skilling so those advice that the advisory that is given from lnd is to ensure that the employee not only uh, you know delivers what the organization wants but also see what where there is a scope of the person's skills being utilized so that's another uh, recommendation that we give communities of practice um uh, is done by we do have a domain coe within the organization they also create community communities of practice so these people get together exchange ideas think about innovations think about incubation centers that they create within the organization if there is a new idea how do we see that this idea is is uh, somehow uh, picked up by one of the senior leader who will be the sponsor for the program and see if we can develop that into a proper um uh, you know service or a product so this is another thing that we have uh, done again flexibility in learning is the key if you are stubborn saying that i'm only going to do uh, online learning it's not going to work you need to have a combination depending on the mindset of the employees within the organization maybe a particular team or a particular account is pretty okay doing a classroom but someone else would not like a classroom but they want to do everything at a self paced manner someone wants a complete module end to end 2 hours 3 hours and they're very happy with it but some people are very happy with the micro learning so we need to identify how do we identify that through the analytics that we have again a lot of vendors that we have in the market are giving you all the analytics you don't have to really worry the learning management system is throwing up some data points right saying this saying that this particular program you have 100% hit rate this particular program people come in but they leave in with leave within the next 5 uh, or 10 minutes so these are the metrics that we need to um, understand the another important thing is you need to ensure that the ownership of that learning is not just with lnd the ownership of learning is also with their respective managers making the managers accountable for their employees learning also is very key uh, vivek if you ask me because we just have a bunch of learning uh, people within the organization if you're expecting us to run it for a 5000 10000 organization it's not possible so having the manager partner with lnd team ensuring that my development and my team's development is my job it's part of my kra this really helps us take it along So that's great, Sirisha. I mean, thank you very much for this interesting perspective. And I'm sure that I mean, for me at least, there were a lot of takeaways. And I'm sure that when uh, the quotes are published or your the snippets or video bytes are published, there are a lot of takeaways for the industry peers as well. So Absolutely. I want to thank you very much for your precious time today. Mm -hmm.